there was no party. All guidance was followed uh, completely during number 10. As Boris Johnson prepares for the end of the official investigation into pandemic parties, we reveal what happened behind the world's most famous front door. When you and your colleagues in government saw Boris Johnson say none of the rules had been broken, we were watching it all live and we just sort of looked at each other in disbelief, like, why? Why is he denying this? For the first time, members of his staff describe what they saw during lockdown. There were bottles, empties, rubbish, in the bin, but overflowing. You would go into work in the morning in 10 Downing Street and find empty bottles littered around the place. Yep. It's been chaos. Someone's just told me it's hideously deteriorating. All is calm. All is calm? Do you, do you think you might be in denial about that? Hello. So I've just seen the thing that the Met's finished. Yet with a single fine, Boris Johnson has managed to survive the storm. I will touch base with you soon if that's OK. We know now Boris Johnson's not going to get any more fines. And it's the Labour leader who's put his own future on the line after a lockdown beer. If the police decide to issue me with a fixed penalty notice, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. For some people, Conservatives or not, there is a whiff of hypocrisy about this. We went after Boris Johnson because he lied to Parliament. For months, we've been with Tory MPs behind the scenes, agonising over whether to sack or back their boss. Most have stuck with him. Some have not. There's never a good time to topple a Prime Minister. So you've written what you'll say when you call for him to resign. You're just not sure when you're going to do it. Do you think he'll survive this? I think... I think he should. Who will take the blame for the mess, the anger and the embarrassment? What happened under Boris Johnson's roof? January and Westminster, like the whole country, reeling from weeks of claims that those who made the rules that locked us down in the pandemic held parties in number 10. Morning, how are you doing? It's the nation's conversation. It's the nation's phone-in politics of parties. Does it matter to you? It matters a hell of a lot to some people. It's one rule for them and another rule for us. They're treating us like idiots, really. It's just liars after liars. The police are investigating Downing Street, but the first official verdict, an early summary of a Whitehall investigation, is about to drop. I'm waiting for the inquiry by Sue Gray. Sue Gray. Sue Gray. Sue Gray. Sue Gray will decide. An obscure civil servant, Sue Gray, has become a household name. Her initial report into the parties could change everything for the Prime Minister. OK. And it's on gov.uk. Yeah. Is that where it's going to go? Everyone's sitting refreshing their own page. The two things that Tory MPs are looking for is whether or not there's evidence, as one of them put, me, put it to me, of gross hypocrisy, or whether the Prime Minister misled the House. In other words, if he's been telling porkies, which is like the worst thing that you can do around here, in Parliament. The first whiff of trouble came weeks before, with reports of parties in Number 10. The story exploded when footage emerged of Downing Street staff joking about how to spin their way out of the situation if it leaked. I've just seen reports on Twitter that there was a Downing Street Christmas party on Friday night. Do you recognise those reports? I went home. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. Um, Boozy get-togethers uh, in the building where the rules had been made that outlawed everyone else doing the same. As millions of people were locked down last year, was a Christmas party thrown in Downing Street. What I can tell the right honourable gentleman is that all guidance was followed uh, completely during number 10. Last Christmas, were Christmas parties allowed in London? So, look, if you're... Uh, so, generally, no. 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 Generally, no. There was no party and no Covid rules were broken. No rules broken. That defence didn't last for long. The first Sue Gray report laid it bare. It's there. 12 pages. So there's more events. So there's new events here. 
Yeah. There are one, two, three, four, well, five. 16 so total. there's 16, and yeah. 12 of them have been referred to the cops. Yeah. Wow, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Failure of leadership, serious failure to observe high standards, excessive consumption of alcohol, and some people wanted to raise it at the time. Dozens and dozens of Downing Street staff have been interviewed by the official inquiry. Dozens find, including two of the three tonight who'll tell you what they saw. Put it on, everybody on, sink clap. They've all asked us to protect their identities. So when you and your colleagues in government saw Boris Johnson say none of the rules had been broken? We were watching it all live and we just sort of looked at each other in disbelief, like, why? Why is he denying this? When we've been with him this entire time, we knew that the rules had been broken. We knew these parties happened. I mean, it is quite clear that he lied to Parliament. They were every week. The event invites for Friday press office drinks were just nailed into the diary. There were actually invites. There was a weekly regular invite to press office drinks on Friday nights. Yes, wine time Fridays. Invites that were in everyone's calendar for every Friday at 4 p.m. At four o'clock in the afternoon was wine time. Yes. A former official told us socialising became routine, even when many of us were forced to stay at home. It was pretty typical for the press team to have drinks in their office. There's a lot of young, sociable people there. And I think it became a lifeline during the pandemic, particularly if you were sort of living alone on Fridays to have this chance to work at your desk and drink together. It also wasn't unusual for the Prime Minister to be there. I mean, partly the geography of the building means that the press office is in his sightline as he walks up to his flat. He seemed to be a believer in letting his staff let their hair down a little bit. I think it speaks to his temperament and his leadership as well. He wants to be liked by everybody. The Downing Street press chief's leaving do was one of several events where Boris Johnson turned up. Lee Kane's leaving do. Can you just tell us what happened at that event? There was about 30 people, if not more, in a room. Everyone was stood shoulder to shoulder, some people on each other's laps. People were sitting on each other's laps? Yes, one or two people. During the time of social distancing? Yeah. And the Prime Minister came? The Prime Minister was on his way up to his flat and he came by to make a speech for Lee Kane. He just wanted to thank Lee for all his work. He gave a little speech about it. Sue Gray's first summary said some staff felt they couldn't complain. And we've heard what happened when a number 10 custodian, a security guard, tried to stop a party in full flow. I remember when a custodian tried to stop it all and he was just shaking his head in this party, being like, this shouldn't be happening. People laughed at him. People made fun of him because he was so worked up that this party was happening and it shouldn't be happening. What does it take though for you to be sitting here and saying that as an employee of the government? I mean, why are you speaking out? Look, I believe in transparency. I think the public should know what's been going on. Sue Gray's first report said there had been serious failings. Bluntly, terrible mistakes were made by those in charge. I think we can cross to the Commons now where Boris Johnson is about to give his reaction to Sue Gray's report. Yeah. Mr Speaker, with, with your permission, I would like to make a statement. But firstly, I want to say... I'm sorry? Sorry. And I'm sorry for the things we simply didn't get right, and also sorry for the way that this matter has been handled. I now call Keir Starmer the Leader of the Opposition. The British public aren't fools. They never believed a word of it. They think the Prime Minister should do the decent thing and resign. Yeah. 
Theresa May is trying to stand up. Can you imagine if she stands up? Theresa May. What the Grey report does show is that Number 10 Downing Street was not observing the regulations they had imposed on members of the public. So either my right honourable friend had not read the rules, or didn't understand what they meant, and others around him, or they didn't think the rules applied to Number 10. Which was it? The police were already investigating too, and the very fact of that investigation led Labour to call for Boris Johnson to quit. While the report laid lots of little bits of dynamite, nothing actually has exploded under Boris Johnson personally tonight. But it's bad, and the public reaction to it will be bad. But love or loathe Boris Johnson, there is no one with his dominance. He's the most dominant figure in British politics and has been for a long time. That rare combination, a politician and a true celebrity, running and winning as London mayor, not once, but twice. A figure of fun, but deadly serious about power. Opposing his old friend and choosing the gamble of backing leave. The truth is that it has been agonisingly difficult. Anyone would think he likes the attention. Winning. Quitting when it looked like Brexit was being watered down. If you really think it's this bad and there is another resigned. way... I tried resigning. I did resign. Well, you sure. resigned, but you could, but you could, you could run. Let us see what happens in, uh, in the next uh, few weeks and months. Then that landslide. So many traditional red Labour seats turning blue. We did it! We pulled it off, didn't we? We will at last be able to... Hi, Laura. Thank you Up very to you, much. please. Go ahead. Thank you. We must keep the Keep distance. the social distancing. No politician so hard to ignore. No politician, in my experience, harder to pin down. Do you like living here? It's great. I mean, it's, it's absolutely great. Do you and, see yourself being here for the very long this term? Is, uh, uh, well, we're, we're working very hard, Laura. And I thought I got through this interview already, folks. I mean, what's going on? She keeps asking me questions. Trouble's never far away. You should be in Brussels negotiating. Yes, we have been negotiating. You are not. You are immorally in leave. But every time... Forgive me. Boris Johnson seems able to wriggle through. Yesterday I went, uh, as, as we all must, uh, 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 to, to Peppa Pig World. Boris Johnson got them a huge majority just two years ago. And he's the most gifted politician of his generation, in lots of people's views. He may also, in other people's views, be the most gifted and the most flawed politician in this generation, which is why the Tories have spent more than 10 years agonising about this guy, right? They're so conflicted as a group. The pandemic emergency was a national emergency, but the behaviour in Number 10 created a political one too. I've been talking to MPs for months as they've grappled with sacking or backing their boss, yeah. sometimes changing their minds. This man used to be in charge of party discipline. At this point in the saga, he simply hadn't decided what to do. I just think this issue, the reason why it won't go away is because it, it is actually quite important, because it's about do ministers, do the people that make the laws think the laws apply to them and that they have to obey them? That's, that's quite fundamental. And the second thing is that do, do ministers and the prime minister, do they tell the truth to parliament and to the public? And that's quite fundamental. But if he can still win elections, others want to stick. I'm Jay Barry. I'm the Member of Parliament for Rossendale and Darwin, which is uh, a marginal constituency in the North West. It's absolutely certain that in the 2019 general election, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson was a huge uh, plus for our party. <laughs> I was Northern Powerhouse Minister, so I was going all over the north of England with the Prime Minister. It was like walking around with a sort of rock and roll celebrity. It wasn't really like I'd ever experienced politics. We were absolutely mobbed. For so many Tory MPs, Boris Johnson means winning. 
My majority was 500 when I was first elected. He got me up to 17,000 last time. I mean, you know, I, I think those of us in seats like that, you know, we are sort of like quite reluctant to ditch someone that can deliver that for us. And, you know, when there's no other leader we could easily think of who could replicate it. Uh, but that's the, the real aggravation of the situation in which we find ourselves. And removing a leader with such appeal is a gamble. His backers reckon the public cares much more about making ends meet. And Tory MPs can only oust him if 54 write a letter calling for a vote of confidence. This is BBC Scotland. Now, Wednesday's top story. There's been a chorus of calls for the Prime Minister to quit today. Leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, Douglas Ross, told Boris Johnson his position was no longer tenable. I came to a conclusion that I never thought I'd, I'd reach with a, a leader of the UK party or, or a sitting Prime Minister. And a number of people said, well, will you change your mind? Can anything change your mind? And I said, absolutely not. Some MPs acted on public outrage. Others have had longer-term doubts. I wrote my letter of no confidence a long time ago. I feel that the Prime Minister has let down my constituents and I have been 100% consistent in that view. When people write to you, they tell you their background, they tell you things like, I've always been a Conservative supporter. People who are telling me that they have voted Conservative in every election since they were 18 years old, saying that they can't do so again because they feel that the Prime Minister has let them down. But loyalists say parties in government are just not at the top of the list. The Prime Minister has continuously delivered, and that's what Conservative MPs, fundamentally, the majority of them, are concerned about, and that's what the public are concerned about. There have always been parts of the Conservative Party who've despaired of Boris Johnson and his love of flouting convention. Yet anger was across the board when it emerged that precisely when he was imploring the country to follow the rules, in number 10, they were being ignored. Not just the odd breach, but a different world. How would you describe his overall attitude towards the seriousness of COVID and dealing with it? And then perhaps how that translated into his attitude to, to the rules? I remember at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, he was extremely reluctant to recognise that it was going to be a problem. And he was even making jokes about Kung flu. And really, until he was looking at footage of people having heart attacks and dying in car parks in Lombardy, and then eventually getting it himself, it was that fear that finally got him to take action. I got the sense that he didn't want to think about the rules, ever. I mean, trying to get him to wash his hands was hard enough. Another insider told us how in the building where the COVID rules were being drafted, the culture, in a way, became relaxed. He's a freedom-loving conservative, I mean, at his core. And I think that suddenly became something he had to keep in check. There's probably a sense of disbelieving for himself. The majority of people need to follow these rules, and that's the right message to send. But I think it stopped short of him almost seeing himself as part of that majority. And within the building and his general interactions, it felt like business as usual. Number 10 staff described long and gruelling days, travelling to and from work through a COVID ghost town outside. But once in the building, the pandemic rules didn't seem to apply. We saw it as our own bubble. Everything just continued as normal. Social distancing didn't happen. You know, we didn't wear face masks. It wasn't like the outside world. It just continued as it always had done. And we would no extra rules in place or anything like that. So to be really clear about this, you and your colleagues felt that you had essentially permission from Boris Johnson to have these events. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Because he was there. He may have just been popping through on the way to his flat because that's what would happen. You know, he wasn't there saying this shouldn't be happening. He wasn't saying, can everyone break up and go home? 
can everyone socially distance? Can everyone put masks on? No, he wasn't telling anybody that. He was grabbing a glass for himself. His principal private secretary himself was organizing. His staff were organizing parties. There were even invites. In May 2020, Martin Reynolds, the Prime Minister's most senior civil servant, organized a bring your own booze party on email. His email appeared and it ruffled a lot of feathers. There were lots of instant messages flying about, the main focus of which seemed to be, <laughs> what on earth is this? But if it's coming from the most senior civil servant in the building, and the Prime Minister is going to be there to thank everybody. I mean, that guy's job was to make sure our building was COVID secure. Like, the Prime Minister had nearly died from COVID. Some staffers thought it was wrong at the time. Foolish. As soon as that email went around, I think people knew that it would be trouble if and when it got out. And what difference did it make that the Prime Minister's own attitude towards the rules was, as you've said, pretty relaxed? I think it made the difference in that if a PM or his chief of staff set a rule for the building that nobody was to be outside in groups with alcohol, then it wouldn't have happened. It's as straightforward as that. In some ways, it happened because people were happy for it to happen. When you were at that event in the garden, talking to each other, people having a drink, having some cheese and wine. Do you remember what went through your mind then? Did you think, maybe we shouldn't be doing this? I suspect it went through everyone's mind because it was so different to what you would be doing when you left that building. The Prime Minister was in charge of the rules, but says it didn't occur to him they were being broken. I think he's very adept at believing his version of the truth. And it's interesting because obviously he's often referred to as a liar. But I think it's more complicated than that. I think he's very good at retrofitting events and then genuinely believing the conclusion he's now come to. I think he would pass a lie detector test if he were asked, did you genuinely believe you weren't breaking the rules? But I also believe he must have known that some of these events just could not be within the rules. In theory, a Prime Minister would not have been able to stay on like this. In practice, when it's Boris Johnson, the answer is not the same. I am Will Walden, and for a long time, Boris Johnson's communications director. So you've known him for a long time, well over a decade. And how would you describe him? What's he like? It's complicated. Um, you know, he's capable of extraordinary moments of uh, understanding and compassion, particularly on a kind of one-to-one -one personal basis, which I think would surprise many people. Mm -hmm. um, he's also enormously frustrating, um, uh, immensely so, but he is who he is. I remember uh, while he, when he was mayor, we had a trip to Israel in the occupied Palestinian territories, and I was enormously frustrated with him, and I remember him saying to me, privately, he said, oh, you, you're really fed up with me, aren't you? And, and I was I was spitting nails and I said, yeah, I, frankly, Mr. Mayor, I am. And, and he said, but you know I'm never going to change. You know I am who I am. And I think in a sense, anyone that thinks that everything that's happened over the last decade, everything that's happened over the last two and a half years, everything that's happened, for example, with Partygate, is going to fundamentally change Boris Johnson, that's for the birds. What's it been like watching him? Well, it's a roller coaster. He is the most unpredictable politician in a normally staid political arena. Why did you think he was the right person to be leader of the Tory party? First of all, because you can't have him sitting in the wings, because he's at his best when he's at the centre of the stage. And the second thing is, um, I've always felt that he, in a funny sort of peculiar way, is he, you, you can't be indifferent to him. Love him or hate him, he's right in front of you. And uh, the result of all of that is he has the capacity, peculiar capacity, I've always felt, to be able to reach people uh, all over the place that normal parliamentary politicians struggle sometimes to get to. That profile, along with public frustration over Brexit, meant a massive Commons majority. Hello, come in. 
But some Tories fear Boris Johnson is wasting this political opportunity. This is a government that has a massive Commons majority. It ought to be able to put forward a legislative programme that it can have 100% confidence will get through and will get through unamended. What we have at the moment is seeds of doubt having been sown, MPs feeling that they have been led up the garden path, the direction changes, and so you end up in what just looks a bit confused, a mess. Look, there was always chaos wherever you went, and I think there's an argument that, you know, he encourages this. I actually think that's nonsense. I, I think that deep down he knows it can be it can be destructive, and I. But I think, at his heart, he's a headline writer. He's a, he's an interloper. You know, when he wants to be, he's deeply serious and and and, and deeply thoughtful. But he also is incredibly frustrating. I think, he thinks detail is for others. Is it true, in your view, that he enjoys chaos? No, nobody enjoys chaos. I just think he, um, he's better than anybody else at getting through it. Uh, he rolls with the punches, a little bit like boxing, really. The great boxers of the world aren't always necessarily the biggest punchers, but the people can ride punches. You know, Muhammad Ali uh, was a phenomenal boxer. He didn't have a massive punch on him, but he just rode everybody else's punches, and you never really got him. In a way, that's Boris Johnson. Days after the initial Whitehall verdict on parties, the Prime Minister overhauls his team, having promised the same mistakes would never happen again after all the anger and embarrassment. Some number 10 staff pay the price with their jobs. Yet again, Boris Johnson's political melodrama dominated the agenda. And whether by choice or design, four of his most senior staff exit in a single day. One of the Prime Minister's longest serving members of staff, Munira Mirza, has quit Downing Street. Have we got a camera on the roof? Yeah. Yeah. Jack Doyle's resigned, but I can't confirm it. Weather in a moment, but some breaking news for you now. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has the latest in Westminster. Laura. That's right, Sophie. In the last few minutes, we've confirmed reports that the Director of Communications, which is a really very important job in Downing Street, Jack Doyle, has resigned. It certainly adds to the sense of instability around Boris Johnson's leadership tonight. Four people in one night. It's impossible to predict where it's going to end up, right? Absolutely impossible. Does Boris Johnson burn people? Yes, he does burn people, and all politicians do that to a degree. But I also think that, you know, Boris is a loner. He comes from a loner sort of background. He's un unused to trusting people, which probably makes burning people slightly easier. What would he do to survive? Because through the last few months, you know, deputy heads have rolled. But he's still there. You know, some would say they need to change their teacher. He's not going to go. He's, he, I suspect he'll be dragged kicking and screaming from number 10. And that's not because he's, in, you know, in, inherently arrogant and he thinks, well, I'm better than everyone else. And I'm gonna... I think it's just he's fought hard to get there. He's there and he thinks that there are better times ahead. Downing Street insiders also describe a Prime Minister who'd do anything to move on. He's a nice guy, but he knows where the bodies are and he will be cutthroat in order to protect his own interests. What do you think Boris Johnson would do to survive this? I think he'd throw his entire team underneath a bus to try and survive this. It's right at the end of February now, and Western leaders are understandably completely focused on what on earth is going on in Ukraine and the terrible unfolding situation there on the ground. And that means that Tory MPs who've got doubts about Boris Johnson, well, they're keeping stim, really, because the timing for them to put their head above the parapet and say he's got to go is all wrong. The leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Douglas Ross, has announced he's removing his letter of no confidence in Prime Minister Boris Johnson, saying it was essential to fully support the UK government's efforts over Ukraine. I never imagined there would be a reason to withdraw my letter, but I also never imagined war in Europe. I didn't imagine looking at the TV at night and seeing shallow graves with 
innocent men, women and children buried in them. I, I didn't imagine, you know, the brutal uh, Russian regime taking uh, cities and demolishing them. How are you? How are you? You know how are you? It was that walk around that both the Prime Minister and President Zelensky did in, in Kyiv. And to see not just the, the political response, but the appreciation from people in Ukraine for, for what the Prime Minister and, and the UK government have done. And I just think anything that destabilises that situation can only benefit Putin. I can understand, I really can understand the argument that maybe now is not the right time to go into a protracted leadership battle. There are other colleagues who make the point, well, who would replace the Prime Minister? And that's a good question. Who knows who would replace the Prime Minister? But my view is there's never a good time to topple a Prime Minister. That's the stark reality. Boris Johnson takes every chance to stride the world stage, anywhere where they're not talking about parties in lockdown. Travelling to the Middle East to talk about oil prices. All right, there. Off to see the Crown Prince. It's a lot safer than the House of Commons. And to NATO headquarters to galvanise support for Ukraine. Did Ukraine bring perspective? Did it change the dial? I think it helps people focus. With Boris Johnson, you get this. You get the big moments and then you get the, 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 the stupid moments, you know, big gambles about Ukraine. We're gonna go 100% behind them. We're not gonna be intimidated by the Russians. A really big, big moment and a big decision. On Ukraine, in fairness to him, certainly in terms of endeavor, and certainly in terms of putting best foot forward, rearming, you know, getting out there, being an advocate for, for the Ukrainians and for, and for Zelensky, um, it, it's definitely put him in a, a stronger position in terms of the party, but then if you then you look at the detail of Ukraine and what's the other big Ukrainian issue? It's how you deal with Ukrainian refugees. And yet there's very few refugees here. And he's been heavily criticized for his response. And that is the detail bit versus the headline bit. War in Europe shifted priorities, but it couldn't make the police investigation into parties and government buildings go away. The headlines this morning, the Metropolitan Police are expected to issue the first fines today to people who breached COVID restrictions by attending parties in Downing Street. Top line is we know that the Met believe and have concluded that the law was broken in Downing Street and in Whitehall during lockdown. Because we're not sure if we're going to get any names at all. Um, we don't know how many of those people there are. And now for many Tory MPs, that fact will give them pause to wonder again about Johnson's suitability for office. It's very hard to see how he doesn't get at least one fine. Great. Talk soon. Bye. I've just been talking to someone who knows Boris Johnson well. He was saying by any traditional measure, that wouldn't be allowed to stand. You couldn't have a Tory prime minister in office whose government had broken the law. But he's not a normal prime minister, and we're not in normal times. Families of people who lost their lives to COVID are coming to Westminster and paying their own tribute together. And I think some people will be thinking again about that contradiction between what we were being told to do and what some people who work for the government were up to. We're really angry because they shut us down and everything they told us we shouldn't do and they carried on doing it. We lost the last weeks of our father's life. We lost giving him a Christmas. We lost that time Absolutely. with him. Uh, we lost him seeing his great-grandchildren. Absolutely disgusting how they have been back behaved. behaved. And that people, uh, standard people, us normal people, taxpayers, carried on, abided by the rules, and people like our father were terrified to go out and have people come to them because they didn't want to break the rules and they, they wanted to be respectful. Also an important day in Westminster because the royal family are having a memorial for the Duke of Edinburgh in Westminster Abbey. And of course, probably the worst moment for Boris Johnson during all of the Partygate saga was having to apologize to the Queen for one of the parties that took place on the eve of Prince Philip's funeral. 
Sometimes things define everything and bring it collectively together, and that one did. And we were inundated with more letters after that than we had originally. And that told me something very clearly, that this encapsulated to the public what it was all about. Here is the Queen sitting alone in the church. She kind of encapsulated everybody else's problem uh, just by sitting alone in the church. She made everybody remember what happened to them during lockdown. All those who lost loved ones just took one look at Her Majesty of the Queen and that was them. The night before she put her husband of over 70 years, she laid him to rest. Was that a moment of shame for you? I, I, I deeply and, and bitterly regret uh, that, 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 that that happened. And I can only uh, you know, and renew my apologies both to, uh, to Her Majesty and uh, to the country. The account we've been given of what happened that night is every bit as bad as he might have feared. So tell me about that specific event then. What happened? We started drinking in the basement, chatting, and then the party grew. We had people from press, the events team, people from policy, all sorts of people from around the house, speechwriters, everyone. It was a lively event. There were people dancing around. It was a general party. It just happened to have someone leaving at it. How many people were at this event, do you think? I'd say 20, 25 maybe. And then as the night went on, I think it got to 10, 11 p.m. when the custodian said, we think you should go to the garden. It's getting a bit loud now. So everyone grabbed all the drinks, the food, everything, and went into the garden. We all sat around these tables drinking. People stayed the night there. People stayed the night in Downing Street, the party went so late. Yeah. How do you feel about it now? And do you see why some members of the public were so angry and, and hurt? I think it's unforgivable. Just appalling, really. But idiots and morons sitting in Downing Street thinking it was OK to go and do what they did was like sticking two fingers up to the British public. For me, that was the, the most disgusting uh, event of the whole lot. I know he wasn't at the party, but it reflects on the fact that they thought that was OK. I understand there were people, um, political appointees, who were at that party, who seems to me must have broken the law, but also disrespected Her Majesty the Queen, and they still work there. And for me, the fact they still work there tells me an awful lot about um, what the Prime Minister thinks about that event. Keir Starmer has never missed an opportunity to capitalise on the Prime Minister's embarrassment. Allegra Strachan laughed at breaking the rules. She resigned. The Prime Minister then claimed he was furious at her behaviour and accepted her resignation. Professor Neil Ferguson broke the rules. He also resigned. The Prime Minister said that was the right thing to do. The former health secretary broke the rules. He too resigned. The Prime Minister tried to claim he sacked him. Why does the Prime Minister think everybody else's actions have consequences except his own? And yet, look at this. A photo and footage had emerged online of Keir Starmer drinking beer with colleagues at a party event in Durham. The police chose not to launch a full inquiry at first, but that would not be the last of it, not at all. Labour's initial version of events would be picked apart. As the weeks went on, the number 10 investigation intensified. Insiders described the atmosphere. Junior staff felt they couldn't speak out. And there's growing disquiet at how the most senior civil servants, including the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, handled the mess. Some staff now feel like they've been left to carry the can. A lot of these young members of staff from across Downing Street who have been fined feel that they went to these events. They did not think they were breaking the rules at the time because the Prime Minister was at them. Some of the most senior civil servants in the country were at them and were indeed organising some of them. 
I think it's been a big surprise for a lot of people that having been told that they would be protected by senior people, including the Prime Minister, he stood up in the House of Commons and essentially implied he'd been misled by some really very junior people whose job it would not be to police these events. And then they've been subject to this witch hunt to, you know, find them. Another describes arriving at work in number 10 during the lockdown. What was it sometimes like the morning after? A mess. There were bottles, empties, rubbish, in the bin but overflowing. Or indeed sometimes left on the table. You would go into work in the morning in 10 Downing Street and find empty bottles littered around the place. Yep. After months of investigation, in the political quiet of the Easter break comes this. In the past few minutes, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, both being issued with fines relating to those events taking place in Downing Street and other government buildings. The first fines hit number 10 and, to their surprise, number 11. The Chancellor and Prime Minister were at a gathering in the Cabinet Room on Boris Johnson's birthday. You know he's the most powerful politician in the country, but he's not in control of this or what happens next. Thank you very much for, for coming. Let me say immediately that I've paid the fine and I once again offer a full apology. Again, like everything in Boris's life, there is a contradiction. He is both sorry and not sorry, and sorry and enormously frustrated that he's having to be sorry, and sorry and enormously annoyed that he's had to apologise. I, I think the problem with that is that you can't front up to the cameras and apologise and at the same time go to a meeting of your backbenchers and basically dismiss the whole thing as hokum. You're either sorry and it's a problem or you're not and defend it. And it is the failure to do both those things or to choose a side which is what's left them in the position that they're in. When MPs come back to Westminster, the Prime Minister apologises again. I don't call the Prime Minister. I take this opportunity on the first available sitting day to repeat my wholehearted apology to the House. But the plain fact of a single fine is the moment for some MPs to say enough. Quite surprisingly, I was the first MP to come out after the fine and call the Prime Minister to go. You know, it was just pretty clear to me that having been fined in office, breaking the rules he put in place himself, that's just not a possible position for a Prime Minister to be in. So well, it's the first day back, I need to go and give my letter in to Sir Graham Brady calling for a leadership contest. For another MP who'd been harbouring doubts, the fine was the final straw. Mark Harper, Speaker, I regret to say that we have a Prime Minister who broke the laws that he told the country they had to follow. I'm very sorry to have to say this, but I no longer think he is worthy of the great office that he holds. For me, there's been thinking this through, there's partly the offence and the over 50 criminal offences committed by people who work at the heart of government, and, and that's the, you know, it's the current figure that we have, uh, which is going to make probably Downing Street the worst bit of COVID law breaking I think that there probably has been in the entire country. But there's also how you deal with it. And, and I think, for me, if, if at the beginning there'd been a, an apology which people thought was meant, and, um, and by the way, if people think you mean an apology, you don't have to keep saying it over and over and over again. Um, but if people thought there was a genuine apology at the beginning and, a, and a, a full laying out of the facts about everything that had happened right at the beginning of this process, then we may be in a different place. I don't want to forgive him. The Prime Minister now should be long gone. Yeah. And what's happened? Well, I'll just read it to you. Senior Tory Steve Baker calls on Boris Johnson to quit. Really, the Prime Minister should just know the gig's up. So that's just happened? 
Uh, yes, because he'd just been speaking in the debate. Steve's basically said, I have to acknowledge that if the Prime Minister occupied any other office of senior responsibility, he would be long gone. Yeah, yeah. I think there is a real challenge for the Prime Minister when you have both left and right of the party calling upon him to resign, when you have previously very loyal colleagues like Steve Baker who are clearly incredibly angry and disappointed in the Prime Minister. I think it was a very problematic week for him. I think the mood in the party at the moment is pretty grim. There's a lot of anxiety with the run-up to the local elections. There's a lot of concern that party gate has not gone away. There is significant worry among Tory MPs, but the vast majority are watching and waiting. The rebels simply do not have the numbers to try to oust Boris Johnson. And there's another good reason to hang on. So elections across the UK. Voters in England, Wales and Scotland will pick who they want to. Accept. One of the things that helps Boris Johnson right now, but might hinder him in the longer term, is that there is an election campaign going on. There are local elections in lots of different parts of the country. Now that means that the Tory MPs are, most of them don't want to rock the boat too much because they're on the doorstep trying to tell people to vote for them. You are in Eastbury, Hayward and Middleton this morning. Obviously I've been in Wolverhampton, Swindon, Bridgend, all over the country. Oh, hello, sorry to disturb you. My name's Guy, here on behalf of uh, Barry East Conservatives. Sniffing out some good Conservative voters, that's her job. People don't care about parties on Downing Street. Local elections about what's happening on this street, not Downing Street. People are heavily focused on the cost of living. I think people are fed up from parties that went on in Downing Street to parties that went on in County Durham with the Labour Party leader and the deputy leader there. I think there's a bit of a view that politicians have slightly lost touch. The most popular politician in the world will be the man who banned uh, post boxes at ankle height. Do you think that there's always a chance that people use like, local elections as protest votes? Or... I don't know. Hi, yes, sorry to disturb you. My name's Guy, here on behalf of Berry East Conservatives. Decision day. Thousands of seats are up for grabs all over the country. Election nights are always pretty full on and you never quite know what's going to happen when you arrive. One by, ten seconds. Very often it's not what you expect, but we'll see what happens. It's the biggest test of public opinion before the next general election, so stay with us for the results. Tonight, we have thousands of council seats being fought in England. And here in the studio, the BBC's Laura Kinsberg to help us understand what the results mean for the party leaders and their teams. The Tories have had a bad time, but it hasn't been bad enough for the party to move against him, nor have the results been good enough for Keir Starmer to be sure that he's going to be the Prime Minister. In a kind of lightning strike of political timing, just as Keir Starmer was walking around Carlisle celebrating one of his election results, Durham police announced that after all, they were going to investigate him having beer and curry with some of his staff on the campaign trail in County Durham. The Conservative Party has enjoyed Labour's agony and has relished crying foul. The golden lesson in politics is uh, if the goal looks wide open, just hesitate for a second because it's probably not. And the lack of being wide open means what's behind you? What did you do? When you were about to criticise somebody of being a rule breaker, did you break the rules at all, anywhere? Politics is a, is a terrible mistress in a way, and it finds you out. Found out by the return of this footage taken in April last year. Getting together with people you didn't live with was against the law. Work meetings were allowed, but the rules didn't mention socialising with colleagues. You have five minutes to answer our questions, given that you've asked for The police investigation has led Keir Starmer to put his job on the line. If the police decide to issue me 
with a fixed penalty notice, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. Keir Starmer and the Labour Party have not always been clear and consistent about this. First of all, it was denied that Angela Rayner, the deputy leader, was there. Then it turns out that she was there. First of all, Keir Starmer said oh, there were maybe about kind of six people there with him. Now he said that maybe there were about 15 people. Then we found out that actually the dinner had been planned all along. It was down in a schedule, whereas previously he'd said, oh, we just stopped for some work and carried on. I mean, he hasn't been consistent, has he? Well, I think there was one genuine mistake that was made that was about Angela Rayner's presence. And we did exactly what you do do when you make a mistake, which is hold your hands up. Indoor gatherings at that point were banned. And he was photographed having a beer. It does look damaging for him, doesn't it? I don't think anyone thinks that Keir Starmer's the kind of guy who goes around breaking rules and getting smashed on the election trail. He is a hard workaholic. The police have looked at this once already, found no case to answer, no action was taken. The police are looking at it again. I think they'll draw the same conclusion. But his critics would say the relish with which he attacked Boris Johnson over rule breaking makes examination of what he was up to during this extremely awkward. And for some people, Conservatives or not, there is a whiff of hypocrisy about this. We went after Boris Johnson because he lied to Parliament, lied to the country about the fact that any parties even took place. He was then found to have been at these events himself. He was fined for being at one of these events. Keir Starmer also said when Boris Johnson was under investigation that he should resign because he was under investigation. Keir Starmer is now under investigation. Well, bear in mind that when Keir Starmer first called for Boris Johnson's resignation, it was because Boris Johnson had been caught lying to the House of Commons that about parties taking view. place. The mere fact of a police investigation in Keir's case is not grounds, as far as I'm concerned, for resignation. But a cynic might suggest, though, that Keir Starmer's pledge to resign if he's fined is not about integrity, it's about politics. He's tried to make all of this about morality and doing the right thing, and actually he's doing it to make a political contrast. I don't think the contrast between Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson is simply political. I think it's personal. I think it's about the people who hold high office in this country, the obligations and responsibilities that come with high office, and the way that we conduct ourselves. Keir Starmer's backers seem super confident that he'll emerge unscathed from all of this and be able to turn the investigation into what he got up to, to a political advantage. But they can't be sure of that at all. And it seems like a classic Boris Johnson plot twist. The saga that's done him so much damage now threatens his rival too. In the wake of all of this, so many are left feeling bruised and ashamed one Downing Street insider describes a sense of deep regret. What has it been like as this has all emerged and unfolded and people have learnt some of the things about what was going on and many members of the public have also been very angry about what, what has been revealed? How have you found this? I think for everybody, it's been very distressing and shaming, and particularly because the whole period was quite traumatic. It was really difficult to work on every single day. We were learning that people were dying in hospital beds and people were dying needlessly. And we were so worried about making mistakes and getting these big calls wrong and working through it and also feeling quite proud of it. There was a real sort of war effort spirit to it. So it was quite difficult to look back at that period now and think this is what will define that. Not the vaccine programme or the food parcels for shielding people. It will be, what were you doing on the 20th of May in the garden? The Metropolitan Police have announced their investigation into alleged breaches of COVID regulations at Downing Street and Whitehall is complete. So the Met has now finished. 126 fines have been issued. So that's huge, you know, dozens and dozens of fines for things going on behind closed doors in Downing Street and Whitehall that were against the really serious rules that we were all forced to live our lives by. But we know now Boris Johnson isn't going to get any more fines. And without doubt, that is, for some MPs, going to take the pressure off him. But Downing Street still have got a big hurdle to get over with the publication of the civil service verdict. 
a report being published by Sue Gray that's probably going to come in the next week or so, and that could still be a really, really awkward day. Boris Johnson knows only too well how all of this could still transform the public's impression of him. He's very worried about what people think of him, and he's very worried about that legacy, and I think that's why the Partygate stuff will have hurt, because the thing that people liked about him, the fact that, you know, he was different, he was a bit cheeky, he was a bit naughty, but not to the extent now where, you know, they think, I don't want to go to the pub with him anymore because I'm not sure actually he's going to tell me the truth about who's paying for the pint. Do you think he'll survive this? I think he should. Not that he would, but he should survive it for the very reason that I've given, which is that um, we are living in very difficult times right now, from the pandemic through to the economic crisis, and we absolutely need uh, to have somebody that can show serious leadership when big decisions have to be made. And I think he occupies that stage in a way that I think is it, very difficult for anybody else to replicate. Panorama asked number 10 for an interview with Boris Johnson or a senior member of the government, but they declined. Number 10 has previously said it will respond to the final Sue Gray report when it is published and that ministers are focused on the cost of living crisis and other issues it says are top of the public's agenda. At the start of this saga, it was almost impossible to believe what had really gone on. Parties in government during the pandemic, it was a shocking plot that no one had foreseen. And the scandal has battered the government, put the prime minister's job in real peril. And yet his enemies are so often left gnashing their teeth, incredulous, jealous maybe, of his ability to stay in number 10. But the police fines, the official Whitehall verdict, they won't be the final judgment. That will depend on how many members of the public are still attracted to Boris Johnson's political character, what he really is, the exception to the rule.